Thank you for listening to Depictions Media Radio. Welcome to Policy and Rights, the show about government policy and human rights. Welcome back to Policy and Rights here in Depictions Media Radio. I'm your host, Michael Cloggs. Let's start uh, today in Virginia, and we're going to have a brief statement from a police officer in Virginia after a mass shooting at a high school graduation. All right, I'd like to provide an update to what I previously discussed last time at seven. So tragically, two of our life-threatening victims have passed away. Um, we still have the same amount of seven total gunshot wound victims. Uh, the four of them that are non-life-threatening are a 14-year-old male, a 32-year-old male, a 55-year-old male, and a 58-year-old male. The one remaining life-threatening victim is 31 years old. I also mentioned last time that we had one person who was struck by a car. That individual is nine years old. She was treated at the scene um, and then released and subsequently went to a local hospital where she continues to have non-life-threatening wounds. I also mentioned last time that we had two subjects in custody. I'd like to clarify that at this point. One of the subjects was detained, is armed with a firearm, but we believe based upon our investigation at this time that he is uninvolved in the shooting itself. We have another individual who is in custody who is 19 years old, who we believe was involved in the shooting. At this point, in consultation with the Richmond Commonwealth Attorney's Office, we plan on seeking charges for second degree murder times two for that individual, with more potential charges to follow. At this time, I'd like to just express my concerns and, and sympathy for those who have lost their lives today and those whose lives were forever changed by the events today. I'd also like to thank the partners that, that rushed to this scene, the Richmond police officers, the VCU police security and police officers, Capitol Police, Virginia State Police, even Henrico, and certainly our state and federal partners. Virginia State Police, as I mentioned, but certainly ATF, FBI are all assisting in the, in the complicated case that this is right now at this point. So we anticipate having a further update tomorrow. The mayor's office will be providing you all with updates on when that uh, press conference will take place. I can answer a few questions here. I'm not going to be able to give a lot more detail than I've already provided, but I'm, but I'm, I can answer a few. Chief, could you talk? Um, you're going to hear uh, that there was at least seven people shot. Um, one uh, nine-year-old child was injured uh, by. Uh, by being hit by a car, um, two deaths, and two arrests were made. One person released, the other, um, and the uh, uh, the other person is still being detained, um, and will probably be charged with um, counts of murder and other various charges. How many times are we going to have to hear reports like this from a police officer about a mass shooting or a targeted shooting or a mass bombing? When are we as a species going to learn to release the hate and live as loving beings as we should? There's a lot of arguments around gun control, but 
is gun control really going far enough or do we need more should should if we're going to use a justice system should there be more in place um, that would charge this person uh, in this mass shooting with a hate crime terrorism something beyond just he pulled the trigger on a gun should anyone who commits a crime with with a gun get extra charges added on for hate and terrorism I don't know there's got to be a better answer than just gun control there's got to be more to it than just that but we'll just have to see how our governments play this idea out how the United States decides to tackle the problem of the mass shooting and how other governments around the world decide to tackle the idea of violent crimes well so let, let's move on to um, we've seen the pictures we've heard the reports and we're going to hear another report from the United Nations uh, the UN Security Council as they convened a meeting about what happened to the dam in Ukraine a dam that not only supplies water to Crimea and other regions in that particular area it also supplies vital cooling water to a nuclear power plant this same dam also provides hydroelectricity used for farming and other vital needs in the region the dam has been blown up or at least a major explosion like which has leaked poisonous water onto the town and it's it is a major disaster but a disaster that could have been prevented by some military person who would have realized that it is an illegal order to attack a civilian site So, while we're going to hear from, uh, of course, um, we're going to hear from the Russian Federation, the United States, the United Kingdom. We're going to hear from China. And we're al also going to hear from Albania. And we're also going to hear from an expert report um, at the beginning of all this who describes what it is the damage is it going to look like and how people need to to be rescued and evacuated from the area so let's go ahead and listen to that now the 9340th meeting of the security council is called to order The provisional agenda for this meeting is maintenance of peace and security of Ukraine and threats to international peace and security. The agenda is adopted. In accordance with Rule 37 of the Council's Provisional Rules of Procedure, I invite the representatives of Latvia, Poland, and Ukraine to participate in this meeting. It is so decided. In accordance with Rule 39 of the Council's Provisional Rules of Procedure, I invite Mr. Martin Griffiths, Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs and Emergency Relief Coordinator, to participate in this meeting. It is so decided. The Security Council will now begin its consideration of Item 2 of the agenda.
I now give the floor to Mr. Martin Griffiths. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you for this chance to speak on this particularly, particularly tragic day. We've all seen the terrifying pictures of the catastrophe unfolding in Kherson, in Ukraine, as we speak. The destruction of the Khovka hydroelectric power plant dam is one of the most significant incidents of damage to civilian infrastructure since the start of the Russian invasion of Ukraine in February 2022. The sheer magnitude of the catastrophe will only become fully realized in the coming days. But it's already clear that it will have grave and far-reaching consequences for thousands of people in southern Ukraine on both sides of the front line through the loss of homes, food, safe water, and livelihoods. Mr. President, the reservoir which is formed by the dam is a lifeline in the region and a critical water source for millions of people, not only in Kherson, but also in Zaporizhia and Dnipro oblasts. Ukrainian authorities report that at least 40 settlements are already flooded or partially flooded in Kherson oblast, and this number is expected to rise in the coming days. Severe impact is also expected in areas controlled by Russian Federation where humanitarians, my colleagues, are still struggling to gain access. Mr. President, the UN and humanitarian organizations have already today stepped up operations to try and address the impacts of this event. An emergency response is underway to provide urgent assistance to over 16,000 affected people. And this support includes drinking water, cash assistance, and psychosocial support. And these efforts are a complement, separate from and in addition to and support to the Ukrainian government's response, which includes the sending of additional equipment like power generators, mobile water filter equipment, and transportation for water trucking, water being such a, a key issue due to this devastation. Multidisciplinary mobile teams have also been deployed to train and bus stations across the oblast to support those seeking evacuation. And cities in the West are preparing to receive those evacuees, these tragic families. Mr. President, when I last briefed this council on the situation in Ukraine just three weeks ago, I highlighted the civilian death and suffering being caused by the conflict on both sides of the front line. I mentioned then the loss of health care, water, electricity, and heating for thousands of people, and the massive numbers of those forcibly displaced. And today's news means that the plight of people in Ukraine is set to get even worse than those pictures that we saw then. Immediate humanitarian needs are expected to grow as floodwaters move over the coming days and as assessments of the situation and the response continues. The dam is a key source of agricultural irrigation in southern Kherson and the Crimean Peninsula. The sustained flooding displayed on our screens today will disrupt farming activities, damage livestock and fisheries, and bring widespread longer-term consequences. This is a massive blow to a food production sector which, as we know, is already significantly damaged. We are also particularly concerned about the risks of mine and explosive ordnance contamination as fast-moving water shifts projectiles to areas previously assessed as safe, thus putting people in further and unpredictable danger. At least 30% of Ukraine's territory is mine-contaminated according to Ukrainian authorities, with Khersonska Oblast being the most affected in the country. The destruction of the dam may also, of course, negatively affect electricity generation. Additionally, any uncontrolled decrease in the water level of the reservoir may negatively affect the safety of the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant downstream. Our colleagues at the IAEA are closely monitoring the situation 
and as of this time, no immediate threat has been reported. The United Nations has no access to independent information on the circumstances that led to the destruction in the hydroelectric power plant and dam. Yet, international humanitarian law is very clear. Installations containing dangerous forces such as dams must receive special protection precisely because their destruction can cause severe loss for the civilian population. Constant care must be taken thus to spare civilians and civilian infrastructure throughout all types of military operations. The damage caused by the dam's destruction means that life will become intolerably harder for those already suffering from the conflict. And the consequences of not being able to deliver assistance to the millions of people affected by the flooding in these areas are potentially catastrophic and as yet unmeasured. We stand ready to do everything we can to ensure we reach all those who've been affected and need assistance, but this won't be easy nor straightforward. We're really concerned about people in affected areas that we are currently unable to reach. And we're operationally ready at any time to move with interagency convoys and aid personnel into Russian controlled areas as well, and those affected by these events of the day. Mr. President, the people of Ukraine have shown extraordinary resilience. Our urgent humanitarian task is to continue to help them to survive and then to be safe and then to get a future. And we will do so in our terms, the best of our ability. And we stand ready, of course, to keep the Council abreast of any developments. Thank you very much. I thank Mr. Griffiths for his briefing. I now give the floor to council members who wish to make statements. I give the floor to the representative of the Russian Federation. Mr. President, on the night of June 6, the Kiev regime committed an unthinkable crime, exploding the dam of the Kahovka hydroelectric power plant, resulting in an uncontrolled discharge of water downstream on the Dnieper River. Settlements have been flooded. Thousands of people are in need of evacuation, and that evacuation has already begun. Colossal damage has been dealt to the agriculture of the region and the ecosystem of the Dnieper estuary. I want to emphasize that the leadership of the armed forces of Ukraine had openly declared their readiness to blow up this dam to gain a military advantage as far back as last year. Here is a direct quote from an article in the Washington Post dated December 29, 2022. Listen closely. Major General Kovalchuk considered flooding the river. The Ukrainians, he said, even conducted a test strike with a high Mars launcher on one of the floodgates at the Novokahovka Dam, making three holes in the metal to see if the Dnieper's water could be raised enough to stimmy Russian crossings but not flood nearby villages. The test was a success, Kovalchuk said but the step remained a last resort. He held off." End of quote. We have warned the international community and UN leadership about this threat. At the end of October 2022, we circulated as an official document of the UN Security Council a note from the permanent mission on the Kiev regime's plans to destroy the Kahovka HPP. We regret that our calls to the Secretary General to do everything possible to prevent this horrifying crime were not duly heeded. This time, the Kiev regime, sensing its full impunity and with the encouragement of its Western backers, decided to carry out its terrorist plan, convincing anyone that the Ukrainian conflict was allegedly the result of unprovoked Russian aggression is becoming increasingly difficult. Today, only the United States and their closest allies still try to deny that Ukraine's Western, pa Western pa patrons have long and purposefully been preparing Ukraine for war with Russia after the anti-constitutional Maidan coup, blasphemously ignoring the nine-year war of the Maidan authorities with their Russian-speaking population in the east and southeast of the country, a war that claimed thousands of civilian lives, and ending which was the primary purpose of Russia's special military operation in Ukraine. 
we are already seeing a coordinated information or rather disinformation campaign. We are hearing statements coming from the West and of course from Kiev and we will certainly hear the same thing today in this chamber that it was Russia who blew up the Kahovska Dam. These statements are in the spirit of the same flawed logic that claims Russia sold itself at the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant or blew up the Nord Stream. Such quote unquote conclusions reek of schizophrenia and perhaps not even the latent variety. The deliberate sabotage undertaken by Kiev against a critical infrastructure facility is extremely dangerous and can essentially be classified as a warm crime or an act of terrorism. Attacks on objects containing dangerous forces are expressly prohibited by international humanitarian law with dams specifically mentioned in Article 56 of the first additional protocol to the Geneva Conventions of 1977. The sabotage carried out by Kiev has two obvious objectives. The first is to attract maximum attention in order to create favorable opportunities for regrouping its units in order to continue the widely publicized counteroffensive, which is clearly bogged down in failing to achieve the objective set by Kiev. According to our Ministry of Defense, Kiev has begun building defensive positions on the right bank of the Dnieper River, which indicates the intention of Ukrainian forces to go on the defensive. The second goal of today's attack is to inflict maximum humanitarian damage on the populations of vast territories, which inevitably result from the destruction of a major water and energy infrastructure facility. At present, the authorities of the Kherson region of the Russian Federation are evacuating the population from flood-prone areas. The HPP dam explosion has already read, led to an environmental catastrophe. Dozens of settlements downstream of the Dnieper River are flooding, the Kahovka Reservoir and the North Crimean Canal, which supplies water to the Crimean Peninsula, are seeing falling levels of water. In other words, Kiev has once again set out to take revenge on Crimeans for their choice in favor of Russia and leave the population of Crimea without water. We also do not rule out an implicit attempt at a provocation involving the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. At the same time, the Kiev authorities significantly increased the discharge of water from the Dnetropoprovsk hydroelectric power station, which is leading to even greater flooding and indicates that the sabotage was planned in advance in order to cause the most severe repercussions for the population of the region. In our view, it is the criminal Kiev regime and the Western patrons obstinately pumping it full of weapons who bear full responsibility for the unfolding tragedy. This act can be viewed as an extension of the systemic tactic used by the Kiev regime since 2014, which consists of striking purely civilian targets with the sole purpose of intimidating the civilian population. This is expressly prohibited by Article 51 of the same additional protocol. This use of terror terrorist methods has already become a calling card of the Kiev regime, which openly flaunts this, uh, these tactics. It is responsible for the explosion on the Crimean Bridge, the murders of Darya Dugin and Vladlen Tatarsky, the assassination attempt on Zahar Prolepin. The head of military intelligence of the armed forces of Ukraine, Kirill Budanov, has openly announced plans for the further terrorist destruction of Russians. And not a word of condemnation of this, these acts has been heard from Western delegations. The Kiev regime has good teachers who are responsible, among other things, for the Nord Stream explosion and targeted attacks on the Altabga Dam in Syria. The West is accustomed to using someone else's hands to do their dirty work. But in this case, hiding behind the incompetent Kiev regime will not work. We understand perfectly well who is actually planning, preparing, and authorizing sabotage of this magnitude. We are deeply bewildered, bewildered that the UN Secretariat repeatedly fails to condemn the attacks perpetrated by the Kiev regime, citing insufficient information, as was the case, for example, with the shelling of the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant by the armed forces of Ukraine, even though it is obvious to everyone from which side they are occurring. At the same time, the Secretariat's leadership does not hesitate to replicate politicized conclusions 
that supposedly all such crimes are a result of Russia's actions in Ukraine. This is unacceptable deviation from the principles of objectivity and impartiality that are required of the UN Secretariat's leadership by Article 100 of the UN Charter. We call on the Secretary General to finally provide an objective assessment of the terrorist acts carried out by the Kiev regime and condemn them. We insist on fully establishing all the circumstances of the barbaric attacks on the Kahovska power plant. We cannot allow repetition of the tragedy in Bucha or the Nord Stream explosion. Thank you. I thank the representative of the Russian Federation for their statement, and I now give the floor to the representative of Albania. Thank you, Mr. President. Let me also thank USG Griffiths for his briefing. Here we are, once more, with dreadful news coming from Ukraine. A huge hydropower electric dam in the temporary Russian-controlled part of southern Ukraine was blown up unleashing a significant amount of water now flowing free through the dam and the hydroelectric power plant. You don't need to be a scientist to anticipate the huge consequences. The calculation of the damage or destruction of civilian property will need time, and experts warn already that it will definitely have extensive long-term ecological and envir environmental negative consequences, not only for Ukraine, but also for neighboring countries and regions and USG Griffiths already gave us an initial grim picture of that. Not to mention also that as a result, the cooling procedures of the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant may be seriously affected. Colleagues, Ukraine has directly accused Russia for the destruction. We just heard Russia claiming the opposite. As the SG stated earlier this morning, the UN has not been able to independently verify the facts, but has clearly established that this is yet another catastrophic consequence of the Russian aggression in Ukraine. As we all know, there are two parallel wars going on. Russia's war of choice, that is killing civilians, committing crimes and destroying the entire country, and the propaganda war it's waging, trying to fool the world through a totally biased and intentionally distorted narrative, despite, despite a serious recurrent issue of credibility. Let's look closer to it. How many times have we heard in January and February last year that Russia had no intention to attack Ukraine until it shamelessly did. How many times have we heard, including in this room, that everything happening since February 2022 is solely and entirely the fault of Ukraine, which we know it isn't? How many times have we heard that the despicable crimes committed in Bucha were staged? The UN Commission of Inquiry and other credible reports have concluded otherwise. Didn't we hear endlessly that Russia never attacked civilians? except for the 20,000 Ukrainians killed or wounded and those millions uprooted for their homes. Didn't they say that Russia never forcefully deported children to give them for adoption in Russia? The uh, ICC and OEC Moscow mechanism have proved otherwise and reached different conclusions. The world witnessed in disbelief a room full of people laughing in New Delhi when Russian foreign minister claimed that Russia is defending itself from a war launched by, by Ukraine. 143 countries of the UN just don't buy it. The world scientific community is still waiting for proof on the bio laboratories producing combat birds and armed mosquitoes and for the spread of pathogens using migratory birds and bats. They are nowhere to be seen. Everyone remembers the high alerts issued of the, on the non-existent Ukrainian dirty bombs and so and so on. Therefore, the simple question we have is, why would then the destruction of, a, of the dam be otherwise when we have witnessed day and night that Russia has not spared anything to inflict as much as possible damage to the civilian and critical infrastructure in Ukraine? Didn't they do everything to destroy power installations last winter to leave entire cities without electricity and heating with a deliberate intention to force the submission or freeze to death civilians, families, women and children, girls, the elderly, the disabled, everyone actually? What to say about the 2,600 schools and more than 1,250 health facilities destroyed or damaged already? Colleagues, this is not who speaks first. This is not who speaks louder. This is about truth, rules, laws, and accountability. And the international law is clear. Deliberate attacks on critical civilian infrastructure amount to war crimes. The perpetrators, directly or indirectly involved in such acts, must be held accountable. Mm -hmm. 
Whoever thinks that such acts, like others before it, despite their dire consequences, will affect the spirit of Ukrainians and deter them from fighting to defend and liberate their country should think twice. Because in all this, Ukraine is right and Russia is wrong. This is why the international community will continue to help Ukraine and its people to defend themselves, their freedom and their dignity. There is only one way to put an end to the consequences of this war, and that means the complete withdrawal of all Russian forces from the internationally recognized border of Ukraine and engaging in sincere talks in finding solutions through diplomacy. Anything else would be perpetuating what we have seen so far, madness. I thank you. I thank the representative of Albania for their statement. I give the floor to the representative of the United States. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And Under Secretary General Griffiths, thank you for your briefing. Uh, today we have seen yet another tragic outcome of Russia's unprovoked full-scale invasion of Ukraine. It is deeply alarming and concerning the Kakovka Dam, a crucial hydroelectric plant on the Dnipro River, was destroyed. Its destruction has caused devastating floods and impacted the lives and livelihoods of tens of thousands of Ukrainian civilians along the river. We are in close touch with Ukrainian authorities on providing assistance to the many civilians displaced and forced to flee their homes for safety. And we will continue to work with humanitarian partners on the ground to provide assistance. We regret the Council must meet on an urgent basis to discuss the destruction of the dam, which is yet another casualty in Russia's brutal, full-scale invasion of Ukraine. I want to make absolutely clear, it was Russia that started this war. It was Russia that occupied this area of Ukraine. And it was Russian forces that took over the dam illegally last year and have been occupying ever since. To be clear, deliberate attacks on civilian objects are prohibited by the law of war. As a party to Additional Protocol 1 to the Geneva Conventions, Russia has an obligation not to attack works or installations containing, quote, dangerous forces, including dams, unquote. If such an attack may cause the release of dangerous forces and severe losses among the civilian population. The international community is again confronted with the devastation, immeasurable human toll, and catastrophic damage to Ukraine's critical infrastructure caused by Russia's illegal war. The dam's destruction risks massive ecological devastation as Ukraine's already badly damaged critical infrastructure must once again absorb a devastating blow. Those downstream are under flood risk. The water supply to southern Ukraine, including Crimea, is at risk. Agricultural lands will likely also be impacted, further disrupting food production and impacting global food security. The dam's destruction undermines the stability of Ukraine's power supply and could create additional challenges to maintaining safety in and around the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. Although we understand the dam's destruction poses no immediate risk to the nuclear safety of the plant in the short term, we reiterate the IAEA Director General's call, Zaporizhia Nuclear Power Plant's cooling pond, which draws water from the dam's reservoir, must maintain its integrity and access to water, which is essential for cooling the reactors and their spent fuel. We call on Russia to reconnect the sensors that automatically report data to Ukraine civilian regulators and to allow the IAEA to ensure the international community has reliable information on any radioactivity around the plant. While investigations are underway, I will say again, the latest humanitarian, agricultural, energy, and environmental crisis would not even exist had Russia not launched its brutal war against Ukraine. Russia's full-scale invasion continues to put innocent lives at risk and decimate the infrastructure, livelihoods, and safety of the Ukrainian people. The United States will continue to work with the international community to hold Russia to account for its aggression. We will continue to support Ukraine to defend itself in the face of the Kremlin's brutality. The way forward is clear. Russia must withdraw its troops from Ukraine's internationally recognized borders. It must end this war. And it must end the untold human suffering it has wrought. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank the representative of the United States for their statement. I give the floor to the representative of the United Kingdom. 
Thank you, President. And I'm grateful to Under Secretary General Griffiths for his briefing. President, the destruction of the Nova Kokovka Dam is truly an abhorrent act. The United Kingdom stands in solidarity with Ukraine and the thousands of Ukrainians who are tonight evacuating their homes or facing terrible damage to their livelihoods or water supply. We stand ready to support Ukraine and all those affected by this catastrophe. And we are already working with humanitarian partners on the ground to supply aid. The UK has helped support them to pre-position supplies in case of an emergency like this. As we've heard, this act has put thousands of civilians in danger and is causing severe environmental damage to the surrounding area. Flooding threatens to contaminate water supplies and vital natural habitats. Vast swathes of agricultural land and electricity supplies are also at risk. And this in turn threatens food production and the international food trade. President, this is the latest of many tragic consequences of President Putin's war, which will bring further terrible suffering to the people of Ukraine. We have seen Russia indiscriminately attack civilians and critical civilian infrastructure time and time again in this war. If Russia proves to be responsible, it would be a new low in its conduct of this brutal war. We will continue to carefully assess the evidence in the coming days, but let me repeat what we've said throughout. Now is the time for President Putin to withdraw all his forces from Ukraine's sovereign territory and bring his war of aggression to an end. Thank you. Mr. President, I'd like to start by thanking you for convening this emergency meeting. I also thank USG Martin Griffiths for his briefing. The protection of civilians and critical civilian facilities in armed conflict is an important principle enshrined in international humanitarian law. We express our grave concern over the destruction of the dam at the Kharkovka hydroelectric power station. We are deeply concerned about the resulting humanitarian, economic, and ecological consequences. We call on all parties to the conflict to abide by the international humanitarian law and to do their utmost to protect civilians and civilian infrastructure. The collapse of the dam has caused major inundations. A great number of people are in urgent need of evacuation, and more than tens of thousands of people may face difficulties in accessing drinking water. We support the active efforts by the UN and the humanitarian agencies to assist to the best of their ability in the evacuation of the affected population, followed by further assistance. The Kharkovka Reservoir is also a major source of cooling water for the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. We note that the IEA Director General has confirmed that the incident has not yet has not yet posed any safety risk to the Zaporizhian nuclear power plant. However, the water in the reservoir continues to recede, and it may not be possible to continue pumping water to the nuclear power plant in the future. China reiterates that in the event of a nuclear disaster, no one can, st can stay immune. We call for maximum restraint, avoiding words and deeds that could escalate confrontation and lead to miscalculation and maintaining the safety and security of the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. Mr. President, China is concerned about the protractedness or even further escalation of the crisis in Ukraine. What has just happened reminds us once again that anything can happen in a conflict situation. As the flames of war rage on, it will only bring about greater suffering and more disasters, creating more risks that are grave and impossible to predict. The parties concerned should submit to good sense, exercise restraint, and resume peace talks as soon as possible. The international community should spare no effort with a greater sense of urgency to create favorable conditions for promoting dialogue and negotiations and restoring peace. 
no party, especially countries with important influence, should fuel the fire and escalate tensions, much less try to profit from expanded crises to advance their own strategic agenda. China will continue to stand on the side of peace and alongside partners concerned, make unremitting efforts to promote peace talks and achieve a political settlement of the Ukrainian crisis. I thank you, Mr. President. Okay, so uh, today's report was, was very violent and uh, people are suffering. And would uh, we need to do whatever it takes to, to help people? I want want to picture picture something. One, we're going to go to the mass shooting. Just you're the parent of the child who was shot. You know, what do we, what are you going to do about it now? How are you going to make a change so that for the for those who who died, how are you going to make a change so that their death became something that brought about a change, a change in how we actually see things, a change is going to I eliminate the hate for those families that are in Ukraine. It's quite simple, you know. Um, just th think about your own family. You're sitting there, your home, and now your home is lost or it isn't livable because it's been washed over with whatever the poisons are that are contained um, because of because of the the, the damn water spilling out. Um, that your the land that you are now living on has been contaminated. So, what are we going to do about that? How are we going to end the hatred so that no other families have to suffer the way we do? As a human right, I'm going to uh, quote. And we put this up, on, of course, on uh, all of our social media by now. Um, a quote from Martin Luther King, or uh, as close as we can. Whoever you are, wherever you're from, you have the right to clean air to, so that you can breathe. Clean water to drink. And clean land to call your home. Thank you for listening today. Please find that subscribe button wherever it is. This show has been produced by Depictions Media. Please contact us at depictions.media for more information.